This lecture is titled Modern Western Short Story. The lecture is divided into four parts. In the first part, we will talk about the short story and the novel. In the second part, titled The Modern Short Story, we will deal with the short story and the classical and folk tales. We will also talk about new visions by examining the work of Poe and Jacob. Then we move on to the postmodern short story, where we would talk about its experimental nature and the notion of anti story, and we will look at the work of Borges. Part 4 deals with our concluding remarks, and we are really committed to this uh, notion of generating creativity, and therefore, the concluding part deals with. The, our desire to support your effort towards creative experimentation. Now, let us start with the first part. We do not really take it for granted that you would like everything that has been chosen by us. Indeed, you may not like or relate to the sensibility of certain writers, but may suddenly feel a shock of recognition uh, when you read certain other writers. So, you have to allow yourself uh, that kind of pleasure by actually reading lots of writers and thereby discovering your own voice, their, your own sense of excitement about the content, the theme, the methodologies, everything put together. Now, let us talk about the short story and the novel. And as I have clearly indicated, we have placed this discussion within the western short story. And therefore, we I would basically assume that the European or the Eurocentric framework would be kept in mind while talking about these stories, because some of these stories are also translated stories. Wherever they are translated stories, I will you know try and mention it. Uh, but you know, both translated texts as well as original writing in English is part of this rich collection of material that we are going to dip into. Now, the first question that I want to briefly touch on is the connection between the short story and the novel. You may quite uh, obviously feel that this is hardly something that one needs to talk about because the links seem so organic and so very visible. But at the same time, I feel that because the short story happened later and the novel was such an overpowering presence that many of the short story writers have tried to establish the distinctiveness of the short story rather uh, you know in, in strong terms. In so, therefore, I think also there, there are very important differences and they let us see how this question has been articulated by at least some of the important writers we have chosen. So, both are of course, fictional explorations of historical situations in flux. So, I am stating the obvious uh, and both share the tragic and the comic traditions of writing. Now, here I have in mind what Milan Kundera had said elsewhere about the art of fiction and especially with reference to the European novel. Uh, he had said that uh, all modern literature descends from either Richardson's Clarissa or Stern's Tristram Shandy. Now, Clarissa was in the tragic mode and Tristram Shandy as you know very well was a comic novel. So, I am just trying to suggest that in you know both though these modes are very important for the short story also, just as they are important for the novel form. Actually, they are very important for the for modern drama. And I won't go into the lineage because we have already discussed Aristotle and the Aristotelian discourse, the you know kind of impact it has had, and also the variations and transformations that have occurred in this process. Now, the links actually between the two forms are undeniable in terms of therefore, not only the tragic and the comic mold, but also the possibilities of prose fiction in terms of uh, 
you know later on we'll uh, talk about it stream of consciousness technique or the comic and again the comic is a very fecund field and there are so many variations within the comic. But it opened up new ways of articulating experience and meanwhile of course societies were changing. But Edgar Allan Poe was very very forceful in talking about the short story and its significance vis-a-vis -vis the novel and I like to place this quotation before you. This is from a very, very important uh, book on the short story uh, written by or edited by Stone, Packer and Hoops which is full of extremely valuable insights and I would really like you to read this book very carefully. But let me place this quotation from uh, this particular collection. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe considered the short story superior to the novel. For Poe, the unity of effect or impression was of prime importance, but he felt this unity could be obtained only in works that could be read at one sitting. For Poe, the novel does not have this unity, cannot achieve the immense force derivable from totality. Poe believed that the short story is different from the novel and superior to it. So, it is this totality, this sense of you know, this tremendous power, uh, almost a kind of irresistible artistic force which leads you to create one complete piece and you know helps the reader also read it at one go. So, this is what he has to say, this compression, this intensity and a sense of totality that this particular form offers. Well, I think personally uh, we would just keep this important insight in mind and move on in terms of uh, what the other writers have to say or how they have, you know, what kind of stories they have created. So far as the modern short story is concerned, let us look at its connection with the classical and folk tales. This is the second part of the lecture and we will also look at Poe, his short stories very briefly because we have already talked about Poe earlier and we will also talk about Chekhov again very briefly because we have really extensively talked about Chekhov earlier. To come back to this uh, you know introduction to the short story, one of the key statements that was made by the editors uh, is related to the impulses that make the modern uh, short story uh, very, very close to the primitive, uh, I would uh, like to use the word primordial instinct uh, of uh, storytellers. And at the same time, uh, this is to again quote directly from this statement here. Uh, he too, and I wonder why there is this uh, persistent he, it should be he and sh or she. Uh, the, uh, the he too would like to be a myth maker, that is, the modern short story writer would also like to be a myth maker and often is, but his problem is vastly complicated. Early stories were vehicles of assertion. Modern fiction is one of search. I think it is a very, very valid and extremely valuable viewpoint. Early stories spoke for a whole community. Modern fiction is the work of individuals called authors. Again, we have talked about some of these overlaps and some of these issues earlier uh, in our discussion of folk, for folk tales and classical tales, etcetera. You can go back to some of that discussion. However, I think the same idea has been very powerfully expressed by Edmund Kuzik from the, and uh, this is a quote from the writer's workbook where he says, we are in a sense made of stories. Every culture in every age has told them and our stories form our understanding of ourselves and of the world. Okay, very, very rich and important statement indeed and therefore, I, I think uh, what perhaps would be beneficial for us is to uh, use some of the ideas we have already discussed earlier uh, 
instead of uh, starting off you know with new examples within this frame of reference. And I thought you could go back to Atwood's essay where uh, she in uh, her desire to uh, seek some understanding of the doubleness of a writer's sensibility, she went back to some of the mythic resources and some of the important folk tales. Uh, and again, I would say that uh, in terms of a choice, uh, the you know, myth of Narcissus for example, uh, the folk tale, uh, the gold children, these do establish the theme of doubleness. And what is important for us is to understand that whether we are talking about the modern or the postmodern sensibility, but somehow the, there is this resonance of these mythic sources and also some of the folk uh, sources because they keep circulating in our consciousness. And therefore, one can uh, say that there are these hidden roots from the earlier archetypes that seem to again lead to new blends in the modern and the postmodern. And in that sense, there is always a sense of continuity, although the stories of the past, they were modes of assertion, whereas modern to postmodern are stories of search, discovery, finding one bearings and finding forms that enable the short story writer to express his or her worldview in the way it is experienced by the writer. And now, that is a very, very uh, radical kind of difference between the two historical phases. In terms of uh, uh, the choices that Etwood has made vis-a-vis -vis the modern short story, uh, very clearly uh, within the notion of the double uh, doubleness that she was interested in exploring. She is chosen uh, amongst the modernists, she is uh, modern uh, short story writers. Uh, Atwood has chosen Edgar Allan Poe's William Wilson with reference to the doppelganger theme. And in terms of the postmodern example, she has chosen Borges and I. Be, uh, since I am emphasizing the mythic, the classical, the folk, but I think in terms of the mythic, I would like to say that myths do pervade our consciousness and they are part of our cultural vocabulary. In the second part now, we will look at the modern short story, new visions in terms of Edgar Allan Poe and Chekhov. The growth of the modern short story is located from mid to late 19th century. And one of the important things that John Gardner has pointed out in this book that we have discussed with you earlier titled The Art of Fiction. He had pointed out, in fact, he uh, not only pointed out, but he made some very dramatic uh, claims in this uh, book. He says that the day the cask of Amontillado uh, was published, the theory of fiction exploded because the story has an end, but no beginning and middle and therefore, it challenges the earlier notion of energetic plot and in fact, the William Wilson also is uh, another sort of uh, innovative story within that frame of uh, reference. Now, in terms of the cask of Amontillado, uh, the reason Gardner considers it so, so very uh, important as a milestone is because this first of all apart from the structural propensity of the tale, uh, the tale is totally, totally uh, focused on the internal uh, monologue almost or interior monologue of the protagonist. It is a very eerie gothic tale and it also goes very deep into the consciousness of that character. And it is a very, very unfortunate theme, it talks about failed friendship and uh, what I would like to do is to just read the first line and the last line, so that you get a sense of that story primarily in terms of the fact that there is n nothing, no structure to it except this 
kind of outburst uh, of the protagonist. So, this is how it begins. The thousand injuries of Archinato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. And finally, you know, he, he sort of does some very sinister things by burying this friend alive and covering that particular spot and this is how the story ends. I hasten to make an end of my labor. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. So, one is not suggesting that the themes are, you know, sublime or exciting in terms of uh, you know something outstanding that has been done by Poe, but Poe was interested in uh, the Gothic and uh, he was also interested in many, many uh, darker aspects of human consciousness. In William Wilson, this takes a very, very different and somewhat more of a moral uh, turn when he describes William Wilson and also creates his double also called William Wilson. To begin with the name William Wilson is also a fake identity, but then there is this double identity in the story and this is how this story starts. What say of it? What say of conscience grim, that spectre in my path? And this, these are quotations from uh, uh, Chamberlain uh, Faronida with which the story starts and this is how it goes. Let me call myself for the present William Wilson. Then he goes on to say, the ardor, the enthusiasm and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates. My namesake alone presumed to compete with me. And finally, you know, he traces this whole, uh, you know, biographical in great detail, biographical details, the sense of these two coming across each other all the time. One of them follows the evil path, the other one keeps censuring him. And finally, these are the last few lines of the story, you have conquered and I yield, yet henceforward are thou also dead, dead to the world, to heaven and hope. In me didst thou exist, and in my death see by this image, which is thine own, how utterly thou hast murdered thyself. So, indeed, you know, these are extremely, uh, you know, uh, unpredictable kind of themes and stories, although the uh, doubleness of this story again has a long mythic connection. But Poe is considered as a very, very important figure in terms of the composition of the short story about theory of the short story also. And then I think uh, you could read a bit of Poe, read his theoretical work on the short story and then move on to uh, someone like Chekhov. Now, Chekhov wrote in Russian and we are sharing the translations with you. So, this you have to keep in mind because the quality of translations that you read, I, I, you have to ensure that they are really uh, good because I personally have given my choice earlier and you can go back to our discussion of Chekhov in order to understand what I was trying to say about translation of Chekhov. But in terms of Chekhov, again we would try and keep this idea that the modern writer does not receive his world view, he discovers it. Uh, this is a statement again from this important study that we have been uh, referring to and I will extend this idea to suggest that the uh, reader such as a person like you or a, a person like me, we also discover the meaning within the stories. So, they remain very, very open ended for us and so we engage with them and discover the meaning. You can reread Chekhov's The Shemalian to discover the taught satire implied in that short story, because again it may seem like just a you know portrayal of an event, but gradually you begin to discover the taught structure 
and the satire that is implied. You can also read other stories of Chekhov. Our favorite is the death of a clerk, where the clerk is terribly upset after sneezing and uh, you know he feels that he has been very impolite to the general who was sitting in front of him and the whole story deals with his desire to apologize to the general and the general's refusal to accept that apology. Now, this particular portrayal of the clerk is rendered ambiguous and I am using this phrase from Octopia Paz uh, who has said that the comic renders the modern sense of the comic renders meaning ambiguous and indeed in this story the portrayal of the clerk is rendered ambiguous through comic exaggeration. So, read this story and see how this plays out for you. After looking at uh, these two great figures of modern short story, uh, very briefly I would say let us now move to the postmodern short story, uh, which, is, which is very, very experimental in nature and it has been labeled as anti story too. And we will also look at Borges again very briefly. The reason we have maintained this kind of brevity is to retain our focus on the actual words uh, that the writers have used and also on this sense that you know you could pick and choose the stories that you like. The material therefore, that we have explored is material that helps you keep your own sense of freshness, your own sense of vocation as a writer very, very independent from available milestones, but without those milestones you would not know the possibilities, because many of us get used to a certain restrictive way of looking at literary forms. So, therefore, now the examination of the postmodern short story is extremely important and in this anthology by Stonepacker and Hoops, they have point, uh, made this statement and let me share that statement with you. These experimental writers deserve our careful attention, whether or not they express experiences the reader can easily share. For the form of fiction as well as the content, the technique as well as the subject matter are vital indicators of what is happening to us and vital purveyors of value. In his important anthology NT Story, Philip Stavik has rightfully classified these anti traditional tendencies as a series of negations. I would not go on to read the full list of these negations, but I would really encourage you to read this book again in order to see what Stavik was talking about or to go to Stavik's book directly in order to understand his point of view and see the kind of writers he has included in this very, very well known and respected collection of experimental short stories. So, uh, we do keep in mind that sometimes the themes, the style of writing may be inaccessible, you know it may seem like oh uh, you know that it, it, uh, they are it is like an obstacle race, but I, at the same time it is related to the kind of historical experience, the kind of value that is associated uh, you know with the kind of form and content that the writer has you know worked out. So, in terms of Borges, he again is a very tall figure in this field and we had talked about Borges with reference to Atwood's uh, you know sense of that doubleness and let me read this uh, quotation from Atwood uh, when she exp you know talked about at length talked about the doppelganger theme. She says, where does it come from this notion that the writing self the self that comes to be thought of as the author is not the same as the one who does the living. So, that was the question that she had posed and this equivocal sense of the writer is what she felt was absolutely powerfully captured in Borges and I, the piece that Borges has written. I would also like to read 
the first and the last line from that story, this is how it starts. The other one, the one called Borges, is the one things happen to. I do not know which of us has written this page. Let us finally move to the concluding remarks and again as I had said earlier, the idea is to generate creative experimentations. We would definitely not recommend the emulation of any particular model, but we would certainly like you to critically examine these short stories, enjoy them, discard them if you so desire. But finally, I think after critical analysis, if you undertake this process, you would be in a better position, you would be a sturdier writer. And so, we would like to place some more uh, classifications that may be helpful, because this particular essay that we have uh, selected, it appeared in the uh, Guardian. And I think William Boyd had similar instinct uh, in terms of promoting experimentation and freshness in writing. And it is with this spirit that he wrote this essay. Uh, Boyd's essay is based on the following no notion of the short story. And let me read that basic statement. He says, let us say that the short story is prose fiction's lyric poem contrasted with the novel as its epic. Based on this idea and of course, related ideas, he went on to offer seven types of short stories. The modernist story is influenced by Hemingway's, what uh, he describes this as a revolutionary contribution to the short story. And he says, it is pared down, laconic, unafraid to repeat the most common adjectives rather than reach for a synonym and purposeful opacity. I think that is a point perhaps that needs to be noted, because it is also been said by one of the critics, I forget who said this, but you know one of the critics uh, I was reading recently has pointed out that in the short story, it is possible for the writer to maintain the opacity of the subtext. And you know, so the causal elements uh, do not have to surface at all. Uh, and at the same time, the same uh, you know withholding of the subtext in a novel makes the novel very, very tedious. So, this may indeed be a quality that you can examine carefully, purposeful opacity. The next uh, classification according to him is the poetic mythic story. This is the short story quasi poem. And as examples again, he quotes Hemingway, uh, Hemingway's contribution. So again, you have to say which uh, stories of he Hemingway would fit the bill, which of Dylan Thomas, which of D. H. Lawrence, because all of them have written such, so extensively. So again, you have to select. But as a writer, this will really help you understand the variations and the possibilities and the enormous. Uh, uh, range that has developed in the modern and postmodern short story. Uh, then the biographical story is another variety which deliberately borrows uh, and replicates the properties of non-fiction, of history, of reportage, of the memoir and who else but Borges is the best example of it. You know his everything and nothing is an absolutely marvelous biographical rendering of Shakespeare. Do read that a great short story. Finally, we present readings of extracts from famous short stories. Can you identify the stories and their authors? The hills across the valley of Ebrol were long and white. On this side, there was no shade and no trees and the station was between two lines of rails in the sun. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and a curtain made of strings of bamboo beads hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. The American and the girl with him sat at a table in the shade outside the building. <laughs> 
it was very hot and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. What should we drink? The girl asked. She had taken off her hat and put it on the table. It's pretty hot, the man said. Let's drink beer. Those cervezas, the man said into the curtain. Big ones? A woman asked from the doorway. Yes, two big ones. The woman brought two glasses of beer and two felt pads. She put the felt pads and the beer glasses on the table and looked at the man and the girl. The girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants, she said. I have never seen one. The man drank his beer. No, you wouldn't have. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend, their wavered and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a grey, impalpable world, the solid world itself which these dead had one, one time reared and lived in was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to get out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. Thank you.